On today's podcast, I'm joined by Chris Roop, who's also the sponsor of this podcast episode through Patreon. You can learn more about supporting the podcast through Patreon at www.schooloflast.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by schooloflaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. I'm here with Chris Roop. How's it going, sir? I'm doing great. Good to see you. Glad you're in town. Yes, glad to be here. Excellent, man. Well, I've known you for a little while. I'm trying to think if it was three, four years ago, or was it a little bit before that? Um, I guess it was probably three and a half years ago. We met at the uh, CCA. Well, I guess actually it's been, it was during the summer, so it might have been four years ago. Yep. Uh, we met at the CCA. That's right, man. At that time, you were just really just kicking the tires. At brand new. Brand new. You, you had met Marty Simpson and Mike Goodwin yep. and a couple of guys. Mike was fine, but Marty, he's... Yeah. He's the one who got me here. Yeah. Well, he doesn't listen to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> but um, so they kind of, you had the interesting comedy. Um, you bumped into them. You're p- producing a show at your church and or other venues. And you're kind of looking into guys that were in the region to kind of connect with. And they were like, hey, man, you might as well check out this Christian Comedy Association deal. That's right. Yep. And so you came to that. And what was your first impression of this gathering of crazy folks? Well, it was interesting. I mean, it's different because... Uh, you know, comics that are believers was, is, you know, that's different. But it was just cool just meeting people for the first time. You know, where I was, I, I was meeting some people, not many Christian comics, and uh, hanging out in the clubs and stuff there in Charlotte. And uh, so coming here, I was able to make new friends and and started having some other people that had some common interest. And so that was pretty cool. That's excellent. And then the comedy bug stayed with you, started writing, doing shows. and, and- A bit hard. Yeah, it's 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 a tough thing to shake it. Like once, it is. even a bad show, you're like, at least people were looking at me. <laughs> oh, yeah. It doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> even the bad shows, it's that adrenaline rush. Like you know, you bomb. It's for me anyway. Even if it doesn't do as well as you want, or you bombed, or it was a bad crowd, which you know that's what we say when it's not our fault, right? Because we don't blame. It. You know, but you still walk away like uh, now I'm like mad and I'm gonna go back and I'm gonna fix that. I'm gonna do whatever. So every show ends up. It's like an adrenaline rush. It's, it is probably not good. It's like a drug. That's what I'm basically saying. Well, it's interesting. <laughs> it, it you definitely feel alive. Yes. Even if you ate it and if, and just yes, cr- you know, got crushed by the crowd or your own jokes. There's never a time that I'm not. You know, when you go up before, I'm nervous beforehand. I think it's a good thing. You yeah. know, people say you still have, have stage fright or whatever. I'm like, no, but I'm excited before a yes. show. That means you want it to work out. Right. It means you care. Um, well, it's a different audience too. You're not with the same. It's different if you knew the people every time, but you're in front of new people every time, and it's unpredictable. Yes. Even when you think, oh, no, this will go well. This will be an easy one. You don't know. Something, what's going to happen? I rarely gauge an audience 100% correct. I can be, I mean, I can be 100% off. I've had those where I'm like, this will be a great crowd. And you get out there and just something isn't right. I definitely sandbag my expectations sometimes. and go, this is going to be rough. And it turns out to be fine. Yeah. But it's those ones where it's, it's like, I Everything is in place to do well. I'm rested, and the audience is a good. It's got a stage, a theater setup, or whatever. And it's still I'm like, ah, oh, I felt like I could, felt like I could have done better. Still, you know, there's always those things. So it's it's just not knowing that right. keeps you coming back for the next one. Oh yeah, for sure. So you got to um, produce some shows. We were talking about this before we started rolling um, for some audiences and do some warm up spots right. and bring in bigger comics who. You know, that you hadn't met yet, maybe, or that you're able to bring them in because they're the right people or through a, a mutual friend or connection. And that was kind of about creating your own opportunities. Right. Which we both, and I think everybody listening, should realize if you listen to this podcast more than 20 episodes, there's so many things you can't control out there, but creating your own opportunities are key. Like, how did you start? I mean, how did you go from somebody who wasn't a full time comedian to putting on a show like that? How did you, like, approach the, the venue or the person in charge of uh, the theater or whatever to put these things on? Well, early on, I didn't, you know, I've, I've done events quite a bit. I work, I've worked in the church world for most of my life. So I know how to put on events and put things together. So no, that wasn't the hard part. Initially, I didn't approach the church facility yet. I didn't know how that would go. So I, um, I used the Comedy Zone in Charlotte, reached out to them, did a couple of shows that they let me do and 
Um, and it was, you know, it was just a matter of now getting the comics to come in and, and figure that out. Now I'd never done any comedy show before. It was just kind of always a dream. And it kind of started with me and my wife wanting to do a fundraiser and to, to help raise funds for adoption. So, you know, that's, that was the the part. And then I was like, well, I'll do a bit and, and I'll probably bite it, but who cares? It'll be, it'll be great. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so then it's just bringing them in and it, doing the, the, the fundraising side and then itself, it sells its own tickets and it worked really well. So I'm like, let's do it again. I did another one. Um, and then I decided, let's see if we can move to the church and not just do, not just do the fundraiser, but now let's do some other ones. And I've, uh, it, all this was happening right before COVID. So I was able to get about three or four in and uh, got lucky and was able to bring names in uh, through contacts and relationships, whether it was through Marty or whoever, but to get some people to get on stage with that would probably never allow me on the stage with them uh, back in that day. Probably not now, but uh, yeah. um, you know, that's how I did it. You know, he's like, let's bring them in, let's do it. And so it was a lot of fun and not too hard. It's a lot of work. I have enough. Yeah, I know enough people because I'm in the church world that I'm able to get a base group. And then you hope that then the name might bring some in and then comedy itself, people who like it and then spread another word. And that was a big thing. It kind of started smaller and then it, then word of mouth gets out. And yeah. for me, it was really important to kill it on every show. You can't have a bad show. Right. Yeah, cause that, your second show is bigger because the first people came back right. and they brought some friends and people heard it was good and they missed it. And now that snowball effect keeps happening. You know, You know, in Christian comedy in general, I don't know if I always use the term Christian comedy when we're promoting it, but it, you know, people figure out that it might be. Um, but but people have, an, they have a thought of what that's going to look like. That's if they're not in the church world at all, like, oh, it's just going to be subpar comedy. And then so when you show them that, no, it's is, you know, this is there's really some good people out there. Yeah. <laughs> and when they sit, it's like, OK, you know, it's I mean, it's all kind of people that come uh, to the shows. So let me ask you this. So you're in you're into doing some shows now. You're, you're trying to ramp up like we all are after COVID and get things rolling again. And you've had a year to do some writing. There has been ample time not doing shows to write and to create new material. And also I think to take, I, I, I took my whole act and put it up on the lift. Like it was a old Chevy. I'm like, All right. what's leaking? What can I tighten up? What I can I tune up? And then I'll take this one, this hot ride back out on the road when we get rolling again. But I wrote a lot. Have you found yourself chomping at the bit to get some of these new ideas on stage? Or are you still working through the writing part of finalizing them? So I had several ideas I've been working on. I really wanted a big close uh, for my act. And so it was a song that I wanted to write. And so I really pressed in on that and spent a lot of time thinking through the lyrics. How would I do it? Who would I get? I'm not a musician at all. I don't write anything. and I don't sing uh, often, but it was just such a great idea. I was going to do it. And it, I didn't care if it sounded bad. I wanted the lines to work. And I think they they do now. So I did that. I worked on that. I did. The big thing is, you know, over the years, listen to the podcast and and talk to other comedians. I always the same. Um, I always get the same response. It's like it's got to be tighter. And it's funny because then I'll tighten it. It goes now. It's got to be tighter. You know, remove more words, remove more stuff. And so I really dug in and needed to find a couple places to test it out. And so as soon as it was opening up, I was taking anything just to get on the stage and run these, run it, see if it was tighter, start practicing it, and um, and then I worked a bunch of new jokes that I felt like I needed to add that are you know, to be more diverse and add some twist and do something different. So, and again, you don't have anybody to, to run them on other than your friends and people. Mm -hmm. and it's just not the same uh, telling your wife because she thinks all my jokes are stupid. So, right. Um, <laughs> right. So it's important to have that barometer <laughs> or else we get a little bit too confident. Uh, yes. As she laughs, I know it's going to be good. Yeah. You know, if I can get her to, to even chuckle a little bit, I'm, I'm golden. Uh, so, yeah, that's that's what I spent most of my time doing. It's still been a slow roll. I thought it would go quicker here in the spring, but it's it's starting to happen, but it's, it's still slow. Because there's still this ripple effect of the the Delta variant or whatever we're at now, that, yeah, the rollout's a little slower than it would have been. I haven't had anything cancel that got rescheduled. You know, I've got gigs from now till next August, you know, every month. Nobody's called and pulled the plug on them yet. But the wide open thing that we normally – like. Fall bookings would be pretty jam packed right now, and there's still some pockets where I think people are holding out to the last minute and going, "Well, let's see how this thing goes. Let's see how it happens after school reopens up. Let's see how it happens and what's going on when we get the office place fully back open." Right. So it is a little tricky to get the uh, the opportunities 
that somebody else provides for these things, but creating your own again is kind of the way to get get those jokes right out a bit quicker. Right. Well, let me flip the script to you on this one and ask you, because this is something obviously that I have no experience in. I'm still figuring it out and even how to do it. I've heard on podcasts, or it might've been a conversation we had. I don't remember exactly, but um, you know, it's good to have a, a switch in the gear somewhere in the midst of your, your bit. And for me, it was going to be the ending. And so how would you approach creating that moment? What, what does that look like? Like a, 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 a different gear kind of closing bit. Yes. Instead of, you know, you got your bit, you're doing your, whatever your style is, but then how do you like really take a right turn? Yeah. I think to close strong and whether it's a right turn or just the strongest material, there's several things I would do. So one, I would, I would look at my, everything up to that point in my show and see if I could connect the characters I talk about, my family members, people I interact with in different jokes. In fact, one of the things that I haven't said this in a while, but every comic out there who's listening, get a pen and paper, listen back to your longest show that you've ever done. And anytime you mention somebody, just draw a stick person, that person on a, on a blank sheet of printer paper and write their name next to it. So you, so you know who you've talked about in your show. And basically to the audience, once mentioned, you can bring those people back mm-hmm. in. You've already gave enough detail where they're going to remember your uncle Chuck or your mom or your kid that pops off or whatever. And see if there's a bit that you can write where these people would interact. That's one of my favorite things to mm-hmm. create a situation that's 100% you and almost how Kevin Meany or, or Ray Romano would bring in their parents to their joke. You know, you can have a reaction to a joke and say, or my, my mom would say this, or my dad would say this, or as my kid would say this. And all of a sudden you've got three really strong points of view piling on your point of view. And then, of course, if any of those are extreme or absurd, then you could react to those. So you're having you're, you're to you you're on stage, but to the audience, there's five people on stage when you're right. telling this bit. Right. So you've got multiple ways to bring people in. That's one if you if you don't sing, don't juggle, don't do whatever. Um, one way to bring more to your finishing bit, and then obviously callbacks within all that. You know, write down anytime there's a big big laugh in your show. I always keep like a little callback opportunity page. Like, man, I could call this back. I don't know when yet. But this is something that I could just say that one phrase and they're going to know exactly what I'm talking right. about. And that's not necessarily a catchphrase. It's just like the, the main punchline. So that's one thing if you're crafting a new bit uh, to amp it up. Now, if you're doing – I've seen comics close with uh, like Paul Gilmartin. I don't know if you remember Paul from Dinner and a Movie on TBS. Right. Back in the day, he's got his own podcast about dealing with the depression and stuff now. He would close with three poems, really well-crafted, hilarious poems. Sometimes – I remember – there was one about a nun and a, a biker, a biker, a nun, and a school bus or a church bus that broke down the side of the road. I can't remember the whole context of it, but it was so different than his act that when he got to these parts and he would do these on radio, and so they were anticipating, like, when's he going to do the poem? When's he going to do the mm. poem? So that lyrically is kind of like a song, right. but he wasn't singing, didn't have to bring a music track or whatever, but he ended with these two or three poems that became like his signature bits. Mm. So... That was something I hadn't seen, rarely saw, and he executed it like to perfection. An- another thing, obviously, you could do to close the show is audience participation, whether it's, you know, if I'm doing a corporate event or a church event, and I, if I've got more than an hour where I've got some time at the end to kind of goof around, I'll bring somebody up to sing with me, make them the star of the show. Wow. And then I'd rather that company or that church talk about that guy for the next year than talk about me. Like I try to find a way to make them the star of it. Cause they're taking a risk coming out of the audience. They don't know what they're going to sing. They don't know. They don't know they're going to do an air guitar solo at the end, any of this stuff. It brings a ton of energy, but it brings the audience on stage. That's what magicians do. Right. So the magician's great. He's doing tricks, but until an audience member gets up there and the audience is like, Oh, they couldn't figure it out. So it must be real magic or it must be right, great right. magic. So that audience participation thing is huge. It can go either way. Yeah, that's the trick to that one. It can go either way. Um, <laughs> last, it's going to be funny, too. It can be. Um, it, yeah, you said, I think it takes a certain personality to do it. Like if I was solely focused on getting my bit, plowing through my bit and plowing through my little punchlines and not listening to what the other person is bringing to the table, because that's where all the gold is. Right. They're either going to be afraid, they're going to be reluctant, or they're going to be comp- too confident or too co- confident cocky <laughs> so that's four different types of personalities you deal with on stage or back in the club days it was inebriated yes so you almost there was a liability issue with some of that 
So, but to the crowd, it's like you're walking a high wire. They know that you know what you're going to sing, but they, they know that you also have no idea how this person's going to react. Right. Now, at a corporate or church thing, they, most people know that person. So they kind of, they, they're a step ahead of you in the bit or the exercise on stage or whatever you're doing because they know how that person can be. Right. And so they're like, oh man, he's playing with fire with this dude up there or whatever. So bringing somebody from the audience on stage is another one. When it comes to music, like you've got the musician who's got the instrument and you've got you who's self-proclaimed non-musician, yes, non-singer. Brave. But got a comedy. So what you have working for you there is a couple of things. One, it's definitely nothing they've seen from the show. It's not any of the – you're not holding a guitar any of the advertisements or, you know, any of that stuff. It's a complete departure from what you're doing. Right. Um, and it it's it's a high-wire act for you. I mean, especially if you set it up like I don't know how to sing. And I, that would be something I would play with. I don't know how much I would tell them up front. I might – just say, man, I've got a couple songs where he's going to knock your socks off. And then maybe it not be that great of a right. song, but be a very funny song. You know what I mean? So you, you're setting up an expectation and doing a right turn on the expectation. I've done it three times, and it's I'm toying with how to set it up. But, yeah, I typically – I mean, I tell the truth and that I, I don't write, I don't sing. But but And part of the joke of that is is – but I'm, it's for my mom, you know, yeah. so you get that sentimental moment. And I do. It is a little bit of that where I talk about my mom and then the it's a twist. The The whole song is a twist itself. I sing. I can sing well enough that you're not going, oh, that's really bad. Right. It's not distracting. OK, good. It it, it flows, but you're not going to walk away saying we should sign him. Right. <laughs> that's not happening. But you might want to sign him. I could you sign. Wanna, you might want to sign. I could do that. <laughs> well, you know, what's funny is this is what I would. You said you tried it three times. I don't know if you've tried it this way yet, but I mean, if if you just said this, I'm going to do something here for you. This is a song from a mom, and do the minim, most minimum setup you possibly can, and see how that goes. Yeah, that's interesting because does the song stand on its own? Does the song stand on its own? Yes. Do they? If they may come on board at different points in the song as they kind of get what's happening, right? But you haven't given them too much to have any kind of opinion before it starts, right? And that's important. I think it's. The element of surprise is big. Now, you might do it that way two or three times and go, man, they 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 don't come along until like the second chorus. So maybe you do want to give them something up front. Um, you know, but I would definitely see if you could do it without giving them too much. I wondered because I do. I tried to write it where it would stand alone. Uh, but then my thought was this would be a point to help the audience know a little bit more about you know, my deaf mom, you know, so in this unique, it's weird. It's completely true. Uh, the fact that she likes music, which doesn't seem to even compute. Yeah. Uh, and then you explain what that looks like. And so it, it's a little endearing. So you get them back on your side and then the song's like a huge, huge right turn. It's like, okay, that was stupid. You could, uh, but funny, stupid. Yeah. Hope. <laughs> you could set it up with a one liner. Like, uh, this, I'm going to share something with you guys. This is a song I've only sung to my mom five times. <laughs> No one's ever heard this song before. <laughs> and neither has she. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. Like, yeah, no one's ever heard it. So, <laughs> oh, so, yeah, so they get it and they're like, and that could be a, a quick laugh and yeah. then, you, then you just do it. So, yeah, I think I, w- I would experiment with the setup on it and see um, see if that gives you a better advantage or, or not. Yeah, yeah. And then if it doesn't give them enough, obviously give them a, another sentence. But just how like Rodney Dangerfield would tell a joke until it got a laugh and then he would take a word out until it didn't get a laugh. Right. So I would – in the early stages of this, yeah, don't give them too much up front and see how little you can give them and still get what you need. Well, then it becomes even more of a surprise. Yeah. That'd be fun. I think I'm excited to see what happens with that. Can I keep turning this around on you for a minute? Sure. Keep asking you questions? Because, I mean, I don't get these opportunities often. So let me ask you questions I'm thinking about. Yeah. So, uh, well, and maybe this one's kind of a combination deal. It's something I've already talked to you about, but I think it was probably one of the more helpful things I had um, just kind of at that point – a couple of years ago where I was trying to figure out, okay, I need to, I was having to make some decisions about my, my work and then I was doing comedy. And, and so I had that moment where I'm like, uh, should I do this full time? Should I make that big shift? And, um, and so I actually got away for a few days and just really started, um, thinking it all through, praying about it, getting wisdom from people. And so, um, how would you say that you would make the decision when is that moment when you go from, okay, I've been doing this part-time, I'm starting to get some work, it's starting to happen. How do you know when to shift to full-time and to leave your job? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely tricky. 
it's you know you started later like at 47 oh, years 47. old so lots of different dynamics in play there than if you're 20 18 25 right. or whatever so i can i can go back to where i started and kind of go through the different decades of decisions for different comics maybe but you know when i when i started comedy i was very fortunate i was like 22 21 open mic and and it just became obvious to me that i loved it I didn't have a ton of – if I made $450 a month, I paid my 150 for rent, 150 for my car payment, 150 for student loan. Another 150 I bought booze and cigarettes, and I was good to go, you know? Easy. 47 going into it, you've got responsibilities, you know, you've got commitments, and you have decades of expectation of who you are in the household and, right. and what your role is. And, uh, you know, that that's a whole different thing. So the thing I would think about is does the stand-up opportunity – offset what you were earning money wise just from the money standpoint but then the tricky part that a lot of comics don't do unfortunately is think about health and long term right. savings and it's boring it's not fun it's not sexy to talk about putting money away for retirement when you're 20 or whatever but at 47 you've got something put away and uh, and I maybe on a certain age where you kind of want to retire and be able to do whatever you want to do and so will comedy still provide the momentum to do those things? Going full-time in an industry that is so dependent upon audiences, right? gatherings, bookers. I mean, I can't tell you how many of my friends in the cruise ship industry just crushed. Right. For the past 15 months, No, they couldn't work. And they couldn't go back to the clubs because the clubs were closed or limited capacity. There was no way they could replace that income. So... You know, there's there's a lot of things in play in that answer. One, I don't know if it's ever necessary to fully quit. Your, what if you just went part time in your other job? Right. That might be the, and that's probably the most logical step. First off, see how much you can do and still keep your job. At some point, you know, Monday through Friday is crushing at the job, and then Friday night, Saturday night, traveling back home on Sunday, you you'll get worn down after a certain point. But is there a way you can scale back hours and say, listen, I can still work. Here I can flex time. I'll do four days at 10 hours each, and then I'll always have Friday, Saturday, Sunday off, or whatever it might be. It's very easy to to romanticize being a full-time comic right. when you're not one. But the day that you become one, there's nothing romantic about it at all. It's like <laughs> my calendar, You know, no matter how booked you are, you'll look at the, the month past all that and go, I got nothing in 2022 April. I, I, you know, the stress that comes along with keeping right. that calendar full. Um, the stress with, um, you know, you have to be, unless you've bankrolled a support team, you've got to be the booker. Yep. You've got to make outbound phone calls. You got to learn how to market. You got to put up constant videos or, or creating enough new content to where you're making better video demos that show current material in your demo, not stuff that's 10 years ago. You're not talking about Lorena Bobbitt in your <laughs> sizzle reel anymore or whatever. There's all those things that are extremely time consuming. And so for, you know, I think younger comics, especially, they're like, man, I just get to travel and see the world. There's the, I love that part of it. You know, your first right. time to any city is exciting. Second time might be more exciting because you know you liked it and you've got some friends there now, or you, you start to know people at the comedy club. But you know, there's also cities you go to and like I don't need to be in the city ever again. You know, <laughs> you go once it's kind of exciting, but you realize this place is, uh, <laughs> it's just not my town. You know, so it's easy to get caught up in all that. Fun stuff. And I think there's ages where you can do that and there's energy levels that go along with those ages where you can you can stomach the travel and the overnight trips to get from one one night to the next and all that kind of stuff. It's it's tricky when you're comfortable and you're trying to get uncomfortable again and do something else, uh, to go full time. So I mean I would have a long conversation with my spouse first. But I would have that discussion early yeah. on. I mean, I would have it with my kids, you know, not that not that they have the final say, but to to run by them the possibility that I'm going to be gone on the weekends when you're home from school that we play. Right. And so I try to bring them into the situation as best you can. But there's just so many levels to it. If it's just about doing something that's more fun, that's kind of selfish, you know, um, if it's for the attention, that's also selfish. But if it's because that's what you truly feel called to do and you're equipping yourself fully for it that's the other thing too i think you could think about going full-time at a certain point and whenever that point does pop in somebody's head you probably have at least two or three years of things you could be doing to be fully equipped to go right. full-time 
can you do stuff for other comics and performers out of your skill set, like editing videos, yeah. uh, helping them market, putting together a social media campaign? A lot of the younger comics are very savvy in the social media, so that's something right. they can be doing on the side. I mean, I mean, it's a really long answer. No, and it's it's complicated. I it's mean, fair, as you and, just said, and for mine, it was um, I had I had a job that I really like, and I still do, and it's it's a it's a calling, and so that was a problem too. Is I was having to, another issue of, you know, am I called to this? And I was started. I was having to make a decision that the role I was at moving into a different position. So that's why I was like, okay, well, this is the time. If I'm going to do that, is that what I really feel like God's calling me to do? Or, you know, this new thing's been going on. Is this really, I have a passion for it too. And um, that was an element. And then the practical side kicks in. And, um, but the best advice that, that you gave me was, you know, it's, it's pretty simple that, you know, when you start getting enough work, yeah, that demands that you got to rethink your ability to do both. Well, then you can start having the conversation. That's when you start putting pen to that. But you probably, I think, want to learn from it too. Even a lot of what you just said, I think I started thinking about. Okay, I need to have an emergency fund. Things need to be paid off. And if you start putting these things into place, what you need anyway, right? But then when you're in that, and then I've been using this time too. Is um, I can pay for. I don't. I can take gigs that. You know, oh, well, I'll do that gig, even though it's not paying much, and it's, I'm going to lose money probably because i got to drive two or three hours, but I'll get to work out these jokes, and you, know, you wouldn't be able to do that right? Uh, otherwise, and I'm still able to do that, uh, take just about anything just to get on the stage and work through jokes. So I think that's been the positive side of it. And even coming here, I can I can come to Nashville. I mean, I'm able to mm-hmm. stay in a hotel and, and hang out and do stuff. I couldn't do that <laughs> otherwise unless I had some gigs paying right. for that trip. So I've been trying to take advantage of the time thinking, and I and I believe it will be more of a calling situation. And I, that's kind of how I approach it. I'm just going to enjoy the time that I got. And if, if that door opens and I'm getting paid more to do that. And I still would say I really like what I do. So I think it would be hard if, when that day comes because then I'm going to have to really struggle with, okay, has God called me out of that? And that would be. That would be a, you know, I really got to think through it. And I'm not really necessarily in a position where that can be a part-time gig. Um, my work is probably all in or all out. Yeah. Or unless I did something else somewhere else. But yeah, I'd have to think through that. But that's kind of how I landed on that decision. And yeah. it's worked out pretty good because right after we had that conversation, COVID came. Right. And you, you didn't have to be full-time. It was yeah, it was about five or six months later. And had I made that choice, uh, it would have it would have been, been something. It would have been, yeah. I mean... <laughs> I always say, I knew there'd be a time when people stopped showing up at my shows, but I didn't know there'd be a time where people weren't allowed to come to a show. Right. And so that that was like, okay, this was not on my radar. I just figured there'd be less gig opportunities as a guy gets older, you know, or whatever. Well, even an emergency fund, you think three to six months. I mean, nobody could predict it a year. Right, right. I mean, that's where your preparations, you could have been like the smartest person ever and had everything lined up and still been in trouble. Yeah. Which I think a lot of guys, that's probably what happened. So another question um, I would push on you is, uh, so being a person of faith, and one of the things, you know, for me, a conviction is I I, I didn't want to just do church shows personally. Um, Not that I don't like them, they're fine, but I wanted to, one of the cool things I've enjoyed about comedy was actually hanging out with people uh, who maybe don't think like I do or have the same perspective, but so I could have better conversations. How do you do that? And what aspects would you encourage us to do that? Like, how do you kind of be a, how do you carry your faith into that environment and not be a weirdo where you're trying to uh, get everybody, you know, saved and converted and, you know, in the more awkward ways, but just live out your faith practically and realistically. Right. Well, I think, I think that's the way you do it right there. How you just said it, live it out practically and realistically. If, you know, it's you don't want the burden or the expectation always of trying to be perfect around imperfect people because we're imperfect. I mean, that's the first step right. of being a Christian is going, right. I don't have it figured out, which I always try to tell non Christians. That's the reason, you know, I need God. That's the reason you need God. You know, we don't we don't have it figured out. So when, when if I'm doing a show that's in like a good example, Zany's Comedy Club a couple of Mondays ago, they have a new material Monday. And it's like we've got, we got a lot of gangbuster comics here in Nashville now. I mean, it's just like major headliner after major headliner after Netflix guy after Netflix guy. And 
I think I went 10th and only two were clean. Mm-hmm. I mean, the guy bef- right before me was stuff I couldn't even imagine somebody saying out loud, you know, and, and the audience was responding well to it. Right. And I was like, I've got my five minutes of material here that I'm going to do. It's going to be completely clean. And if I take a lump because of the expectation of the audience that it's going to be dirty um, and it's brand new. I mean, I stuck to the concept. This is new material. I hadn't heard any of these jokes out loud before. And after the show was done, there was uh, it took a while for everybody to leave out. And a couple of people came over afterwards and said, man, you're brave up there. And I'm like, what do you mean? I said, I, I had the worst set of the night. I mean, 15 comics, and by far I had the worst set of the night. No doubt about it. Like, no, you, you came out and did actual new material, and it was clean. And, we, you know, they knew who I was. Like, they right. knew that I'm a Christian. And, like, it was cool to see you stick to your guns. Mm. None of the other comics said anything. None of their comics said, hey, man, way to stick to your guns. It was just the audience. So I don't think I want any comics over in the green room or in the showroom. And I probably lost the respect of several comics in town. Like, oh, this guy's been doing it for 30 years, and that's the best he's got? You just stick to your guns. Right. You know, so um, outside of that example, you know, I saw something last week. and, and I was in Austin, Texas, and I, you always hear that, like, how do you go into a place you're not supposed to be and have success? But I think sometimes it's it's the juxtaposition you, of you being in that place that brings you attention anyway. And I'm in this strip mall, and I see a GNC nutrition store. On the other side of it is a liquor store, and the other side of it is a vape store. <laughs> and I looked at GNC, I'm like, that's the Christian comedian. Right. It just was a clear sign to me, that's, that's what a Christian comedian is. They're going to stick it out. They're going to do what they're doing. And everything else is going to come beside them that's not what they're doing. And by juxtaposition, they're going to stand out and offer an opportunity for somebody. Right. Hey, Rick Roberts, just jumping into the middle of this episode to let you know, hey, there's a couple of chances for you to come out and see me live doing a red carpet premiere of the Mayberry Man movie in uh, Los Angeles on September 13th at the uh, Liam, Liam Theater, Limel Theater, L-E-A-M-M-L-E Theater, and on... Uh, September 22nd in Mount Airy at Creekside Cinemas we'll be doing a screening of the Mayberry Man movie to a red carpet event so all those things uh, are public you can come out and see me as well as September 24th in Crossville Tennessee at Jonas Joy Fundraiser if you want information on any of those dates or how to get tickets uh, go to my website rickroberts.com or shoot me an email schooloflaughs at gmail.com all right now back to the show despite a couple of times in my life where I the audience has dictated some of what I do on stage. Um, at this point, you know, I'm living hundred percent for God. I'm not necessarily telling testimonial jokes on stage or whatever, right? but I don't want anything to get in the way of somebody seeing that I'm a Christian and thinking, well, and a Christian does that on stage. I just, I don't want to get in the way of his message. Right. So I may not facilitate it as eloquently as, as, as God wants me to at some point or now even, but I just don't want to get it in the way of it by being something that I'm not supposed to be, you know. Yeah, I think the, I think that, and, and there's a lot of approaches. And I don't think there's any right or wrong one. I think though that you know relationally, you're the greatest impact you're going to make on. I think are the people that you're in closest proximity to. So it's going to be the people you build relationships with, the comedians, the even maybe the workers and stuff, and and you being different and you know like not being a jerk and how you respond to them or getting mad about pay or showing up on time, doing the little things and being grateful. Um, Cause we should look different in how we treat them and how we're treated. Um, so I think that's kind of been the thing. It's a little bit more unique for me because most people just assume since I've, I've been in church work on my whole life is that I'm naturally just wanting to do church shows. Right. And I do like them. They're fine. Um, you know, but, but being light amongst light is not near as fun as being light and darkness, right? So what you can do, I think, sometimes is be be dark in the light. Well, no doubt. That's, that's let the them best. know. Let them know how some of your major failures through comedy. Not everybody in church is shining bright. There's for, a few shining sure. bright with some rhinestones and some false <laughs> fronts, but but I, I know the messages that I I connect with, and even the comics that I connect with. You know, vulnerability, transparency, honesty. Not necessarily authenticity. I think that that term is overused because uh, I know some real authentic jerks. I don't want to just. I don't want them to be a jerk all the time. <laughs> I'd rather them be honest and and tell me they're a jerk than just to be a jerk. Yeah. But but those are the people that the audience connects with. So you could do that in church. You could be the the moment of your darkest moment, 
in church to kind of not well, be br- bright against bright. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just yeah, just what happened this morning, right? <laughs> <laughs> that is for a fact. No, that's great. What about um, another weird question for you? So I love to collaborate. I'm a collaborating guy. I love to get with other people. I feel like I have some good ideas, but sometimes when you're with other people, that make it better. Mm-hmm. So do you do that? And yeah. How how do you find yourself in those circumstances? Yeah. So I didn't used to. Um, there were, I mean, I would say even till I was starting to headline in clubs, I didn't want any collaboration with other comics. Sometimes they would give you a tagline or something and you're like, oh, I'll try it. But I never like sat down and constantly wrote with other people. Um, but the last few years, uh, Johnny W. And, and Brian Bates, who both live here in town, we get together probably once every couple of months, and we'll come in with ideas we've already kind of got fleshed out. Maybe we've tried them on stage once or twice, but we'll kind of – sometimes we actually set a timer for 12 minutes. Other times we just kind of feel the beats to it. I'll offer up an idea. I'll kind of say it the way that I've said it or that I think I would say it on stage, and the other two guys would chime in with some ideas – the good thing about the three of us is we've seen each other's shows a lot. Right. So we can even say, oh, and this would be good in this part of your show right after that joke. Or it could, you could even call back this other thing over here that you did. And so we can kind of give really specific advice. And whether it's 10 or 12 minutes or if eight minutes is enough, then we go to the next guy. And we usually go around the horn three times or so. And then I immediately, if I haven't got those jokes on stage, put all those jokes on stage the next time I go up and see, mm. you know, start to see what works and see, kind of go through iterations. I tend to give every joke at least five or seven shots so that I can at least get it out right once. You right. know, it's easy to give up on something the first time if it doesn't work, but a lot of times it's just, I haven't got to where I can remember all of it on stage yet or to, to say it. So I li- I'm a big fan of collaboration. Two of the biggest reasons are if you only write jokes from your point of view, you become predictable on stage. Right. So yes, it falls into your voice. If we have that comic voice, but it still makes sense that you would say that to a degree, even if it's a surprise. When a friend gives you a line, it's not from your brain. It's, it might suit your voice because they know you so well. But it's something you probably wouldn't have come up with if you sat there for 10 years. And so it's a bigger surprise to the audience sometimes that you would say that. You know right. what I mean? And then the third thing I'll just say about collaborating is early on it was a point of pride for me to be like, I wrote these jokes. My whole show depends on my – and then I realized these comics, you know, like even a good example is Ron White. So he wrote his first set that you saw on Blue Collar. And the second one, he bought a whole act from a guy in Texas and just, you know, you can't fix stupid. It's somebody's whole road act. They retired and he bought it from him. And so I'm like, oh, yeah, comics do have writers. Comics, you know, all the great comics to some degree had writing help. You know, right. I saw a special where... When it, uh, if it's Seinfeld and Chris Rock and one or two other comics, when they get ready for a special, they'll all hang out for three or four days or whatever and just like hone it. And then they'll throw the guys a gold watch for hanging out for three or four days. But they'll get that iron sharpening iron to say, tighten this up. I'll throw this in here. And those are four hilarious, high achieving comics. And they're right. doing collaborating. Why can't I collaborate with my buddies? And then again, it's just fun. It's fun to hear what your comic friends are coming up with. Um so, yeah, yeah, some of my best tags and some of my best lines have come from that collaboration. I don't have yet a set group. And so that would be the next question is um, how did you get into the group that you're in? And how would how would you w- recommend somebody finding a collaborating group? Yeah, I think originally. So they were both in my comedy classes early on. So they kind of knew they knew all the terminology that I use writing jokes and stuff. Right. And we would do. I think what happens, we, we would come in here and do some podcast episodes, and after the mics were off, we just bounced some ideas off each other. And then we made a point of, oh, we don't need to do a podcast every time we come together. Mm. So we'll probably go to Cracker Barrel or something and spend an hour kind of just catching up, and then we'll come over here and, and work through some jokes. Mm. So it's uh, it's one of those things. That they're, they're just naturally buddies. They're, they're geographically close, and we usually all have Tuesdays and Wednesdays off you know, or whatever. So there's sometime during the week we can meet usually. And you probably just got to drive it and try to try to do it. Yeah. I'm struggling to find people in the area because even though Charlotte's close by, the comics are more in the Charlotte rather than where I'm in South Charlotte. So that's been a thing. But I think I've just got to be intentional and also got to be willing to drive. And that, and I, I, 
I definitely got on the computer and wrote with people over the pandemic too, mm-hmm. outside of Johnny and Brian. Um, just pull up the Zoom and you know, just make it bearable. But it works. Yeah, grab a cup of coffee. I can do anything online as long as I have a cup of coffee. That's a great It's about idea. 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. So just Zoom them so they can see your facial expressions and they know when not to interrupt you and just do it. Well, it opens up a whole other world too. So now you've got even people further away Yeah, uh, that you can do that. That's a great idea. Man, it's good having you on the show today. Well, man, I appreciate you having me here. Awesome. You bet. Well, I hope you enjoyed that interview with Chris Roop, guy who's trying to do it right and going through the steps and trying to figure out what the next step is. And boy, there's a lot of steps and side steps in this big profession called comedy. Hey, hope you enjoyed it. Like I said, if you'd like to sponsor the podcast like Chris has done, um, you can do that through schooloflast.com forward slash P A T R E O N. Thanks for listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit schooloflaps.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.